Thank you for uh, joining with us today as we meet together as a church. And uh, if you're here with us for the first time visiting, uh, thanks so much for uh, joining with us today. We'd love to get a chance to meet you. And uh, also, uh, we'd love to get a record of your visit with us. If you've never uh, filled out one of our guest swarms before, we, uh, we're doing that digitally. So if you want to scan uh, the QR code on the screen, um, then that would allow you to be able to uh, uh, fill out a form and then uh, you could notify us uh, that you have been here today and we'd love to get a chance to meet you and uh, chat with you. Uh, for those of, uh, those of you who are part of the church, looking forward to just a couple of things coming up. One particular in today is uh, right after this uh, morning service. Uh, last week during our members meeting, our building committee presented some of uh, the proposals and some of the plans looking forward ahead. And some of you may have some uh, questions about that or some comments or feedback. There's going to be a, a meeting right after this across the hall in room 104 if you have any questions or comments, any feedback for the building committee. And uh, that'll begin right after uh, we dismiss here this morning. So if you're interested in being part of that, you can jump into A104, meet with the building committee. And then we will not uh, be meeting together tonight as a church, but uh, several of our small groups, our growth groups, will be meeting. Pastor Josh is going to be mentioning more about that uh, later on in the service, but if you are not yet a part of a growth group and you would like to be, uh, you can let us know that also through a form on our website. You could scan that. Uh, these uh, growth groups are just uh, basically community groups. Uh, they're kind of arranged geographically, and um, it's a good cross-section of our church families, uh, everything from teens, the senior adults involved in these different groups, and it's a great opportunity to meet together several times a month to study the Word and pray together and uh, just uh, encourage each other as uh, a smaller part of the church family. Uh, but uh, that's a way for you to sign up and let us know if you're interested, and uh, we'll try to connect you with a group. Uh, but we're glad you're here today. We've got some exciting things coming up. Like baptism, that's uh, one thing that we love to celebrate here is uh, when people come to confess faith in Christ and uh, this is a wonderful opportunity this morning. So I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Brian. It's exciting. We have four young people who today are going to be following the Lord and believers baptism, uh, three from the same family. And so I have right here Ellie Page Welbrun and she's the first one. And let me tell you about her confession of Christ. She says this, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I believe that he's the Son of God. I believe he is the only way to heaven because he died on the cross for my sins, and I've asked him into my heart, and he has saved me from my sin. Ellie Page, that is exciting to hear about what God's done. And so she wants to follow the Lord in believer's baptism along with her two brothers. So she's going to be the first. We said ladies first up here, so we're going to let her go first. So... Ellie Page, in obedience to our Lord's command, and based on your profession of faith in him as Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in newness of life. So This right here is Drake Welbrun, and let, let me let you hear what Drake said about his confession to Christ. He says this, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I believe he saved me from my sin. I believe he's the only way to heaven. I believe that he created the entire world and that he loves me. Drake, I'm thrilled for that, and that's a miracle. When a young person comes to believe and trust in Christ, it's an amazing thing. And I'm so glad, Drake, you've chosen to follow the Lord in baptism. And so, in obedience to our Lord's command, and based on your profession of faith in him as Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in newness of life. You can come right around here. All right. 
know what? I'm going to have you just so you don't have to look through this. Jump on that real quick. This right here is Titus Welbrun, the third. This is exciting, isn't it? And uh, he has also accepted Christ. And let me tell you what Titus says. He said this, Jesus Christ is God's son and came down to earth to die on the cross and to save us from our sin. He has saved me from my sin and has cleaned my heart. He has saved me from hell and has made me his own, made me whole. So praise the Lord for that, Titus. And so Titus, in obedience to our Lord's command, and based on your profession of faith in him as Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Awesome, Many of you guys got to meet Libby a few weeks ago when her mom and dad joined the church. And you got to hear her testimony as well in an extended way. Libby, of course, is one of our teenagers. And uh, we've just been excited to see uh, just what God has done in Libby's life and her even connecting with our church body. But this is her confession. She says, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior and he died for my sins. And so, Libby, we're thrilled for that. And so, in obedience to our Lord's command, and based on your profession of faith in him as Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in newness of life. I'm thrilled for you. Isn't it exciting to see people who've confessed Christ? One of the responsibilities of a church is to identify believers through their confession and help them to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. And so what a thrilling opportunity this morning. And trust, if, if you are here today and you have never confessed Christ as your Savior, if you've never come to believe what you just heard expressed from these individuals, let me encourage you to come to Christ today. What this shows us, or these are people now in God's family. God can save you as well. And uh, uh, may you do that and follow the Lord and let people know that you've become a follower of Christ. Let me open today's service with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to worship you this morning and to give you the glory that you deserve. Lord, I ask that you would use this entire service to point us to your son, Jesus. Lord, may you equip us and build us up in the faith. We thank you for what you're going to do even in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Let's stand together. This morning, we're going to be celebrating our God who is sovereign, who reigns over all things. We'll begin by singing together, Lord Most High. Let's lift our voices. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Song we raise, Lord, through. 
you singing of God's glorious might together, glorious and mighty. Majesty, your glory is shining brighter than the moon and the stars. Marveling, we honor and fear you above. God has a plan that he's been moving towards to the saving of all people.
seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So as Scott mentioned, um, we are beginning our growth groups this week, and uh, many of them will be meeting uh, even this afternoon and this evening, and so I hope that you'll take part of that and uh, get involved. If you have any questions about that, uh, right at the end of this service, I'm going to be standing right down here at the bottom of these steps, and uh, please feel free to come up and ask me questions. Uh, If you have have not been able to get into one or you're wanting to switch ones or whatever, if you have questions about it, please come see me. I'll be right here. We would love to get everybody uh, to be able to participate as much as possible in those smaller groups. Well, we're going to have our scripture reading, so take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open to Genesis, the first book there in the Bible, Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. We're going to read verses 1 through 28 together. It says, Now Abram, Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, Please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. And let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, The man took a gold ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, 
Please, tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness towards my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Let's pray this morning. Lord, thank you that you are a God of faithful love. Thank you that we can count on your promises. We know that you keep your word. Thank you that you prepare the way before us as we follow you in faith. Lord, I want to pray this morning for our small groups, in particular the growth groups as they begin even this week. Lord, such a wonderful and beneficial opportunity. Lord, to grow deeper with other people, to be involved in life-giving relationships with one another. Lord, it's how you've designed the church. You designed us to live in community. In fact, you made it so that we're not, we're not, fully, um, we're not fully engaged in what you've called us to do unless we're relating to one another. And Lord, the the transformation that can be taking place in our own life, you've made it so that it happens through the conduit of other people. So Lord, I ask that you would help us as we begin these groups for this particular season. Lord, it's an odd season. Some groups are online. Some groups are meeting in person. Some groups kind of are mixing the two together. Lord, would you help the groups to have unity Would you help them as they relate to one another, that they would enjoy spending time together? But Lord, more important than even those things, would you help them to serve and minister and care for one another? Lord, I ask that, as Ephesians 4 says, that our church would be one where people build each other up in love. They speak the truth in love to one another. They build each other up so that we become mature. We grow up into the head who is Christ. Lord, I ask that you would help us as we begin these groups this week. I pray for health and safety of our groups. Lord, I ask that you would help our groups that not only would they grow and and deepen in relationship, but Lord, that they would be able to minister and serve even other people. And that, Lord, our our church would would have a a health to it, even in the midst of this kind of crazy time, because people are, are serving, loving and committed to each other in these relationships. Lord, we need need your grace for this. Lord, it's impossible for people to dwell together in unity unless we're in Christ, unless we have the power of the Spirit in us. And so, Lord, would you make that evident? Lord, we ask that you would bless this service. The remainder of it, as we look into the Word, as we sing some more songs, that our hearts would be filled with joy. And even as Abraham's servant worshipped and stood in awe, may we stand in awe and worship you because of who you are and what you do and what you have done. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we'd like to dismiss our kids out the back doors, K-4 through the second grade. Kids, you can exit right on out those back doors right there. And parents, if you're new to our church, You can pick up your children at the conclusion of our service right down this hallway. One thing that I've noticed as we've gone through the life of Abraham is that in spite of all of Abraham's failings and shortcomings, in spite of all that happened to him, God was faithful to his promises. And God was able to uphold his promises to Abraham even when Abraham did things that could have messed it up. God is in control. He is faithful to his promise, and he loves us with a steadfast love. If you believe that God is like that, that he's sitting on the throne in control of all things, working his will and fulfilling his promises to you, then you can say what this song says. It is well with my soul. 
no matter what happens, I know my God reigns and he loves me. Let's stand together and sing. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say. Should Buffett, we'll sing together. Though Satan should Buffett, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded.
thy best, thy heavenly friend Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake To guide the future as he has the past Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake Today, as we uh, enter our time in the Word, we come to the final accounts of Abraham's life. Let me direct your attention to Genesis 24 and 25. Uh, Of course, this is the Word of God, and this is really what we're to live by. This is really the bread of life as we come to the text of Scripture. And so this morning, I'd like to examine... Uh, verses within these two chapters. Of course, as we have spent the last number of weeks looking at Abraham's life, Abraham is one of the greatest examples of faith in your Bible. In fact, when the author of the book of Hebrews in your New Testament wanted to point New Testament believers to what it means to live by faith, he devotes a significant amount of Hebrews 11 to none other than the man, Abraham. We as a church have devoted 12 sermons to examining this man's life, and today we will bring that to a conclusion. Although he was far from flawless, 
We here have before us a man who was a godly man of faith. Of course, he's an encouragement to those of us who experience those ups and downs of life. I mean, you read from chapter 12 to chapter 25, he's up, he's down, he's up, he's down. His faith goes in in different segments. He lacks trust in the Lord at times. And I don't know about you, but I I, kind of like to be able to read about other people who fall flat on their face like me at times. So he's an encouragement. Of course, I hope that all of you in this room desire to live a life of faith. In fact, to have faith is incredibly necessary. In fact, it's essential. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says in that very chapter, Hebrews 11, he says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God, so if you want to go to heaven one day, if you want to draw near to God, you must believe that he exists. And just so you know, it's not simply I believe there's a God. You're going to need to have faith in the God, the only God, who made himself known through his son, Jesus Christ. You must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I hope that all of you in this room, Lord willing, even by the end of this sermon, you would walk out of here being a person who at least has an elementary understanding of faith in God, but that I hope all of you leave here wanting to grow in your faith and becoming more committed to living a life of faith. And so as we approach the end of this man of faith life, we're going to learn one final lesson through our series, and it's a simple truth that I'd like to spell out for you here. It's this. God shows his faithful love to his faithful servants. Let me repeat that. God shows his faithful love to his faithful servants. As we come to Genesis chapter 24, there is a very key term that is found in this final account of Abraham's life. It is a term that you'll find kind of uh, pinpointed In Genesis 24, verse 12, so right here at the beginning of the message, I just want to point you to that verse because I want it to be kind of an alarm for you. Listen to what it says in Genesis 24, verse 12. This is, of course, Abraham's servant. He says this, and he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show, and here it is, steadfast love to my master, Abraham. For many of you, those two words, steadfast love in the English language, the translators give two words for really one Hebrew word. And it is the word hesed. I mean, if you were to say it right, hesed. You have to kind of work on that first pronunciation. In this text, what we learn about is God's chesed, his faithful love, or really, I would say even more precisely, his loyal love. Genesis chapter 24, this idea in this term, chesed, shows up repeatedly. In fact, it will continue to show up all through Genesis through Malachi of God's chesed, or steadfast, loyal love. In fact, it's a key term in the book of Ruth, if any of you have ever read that, and how God preserves the line of his son through his steadfast or hesed love. That idea of loyal love, it's probably dimly displayed for us in some of the marriages that we have been able to watch, even within our congregation of people who've stayed together for 60, 70 years of loyal love toward your spouse. Of course, the greatest demonstration of hesed is none other than God himself. And in our text, we see God display his hesed, or sacrificial, steadfast, faithful love to Abraham. And what you find is Abraham responding to that hesed, that love, in a proper way. 
Today, I trust you will see God's loyal love and it'll inspire you so that when you leave these doors, which probably these two doors, when you leave these doors, you will desire, God, I just want to show my loyal love because of your great loyal love. We're going to see three things as we navigate through this sermon. If you're a note taker, here they are. We're going to see a faithful patriarch. Then we're going to see a faithful servant. And then we're going to see a faithful God. And of course, the faithful God, you're going to see throughout it, but we'll pinpoint them at the end. But first of all, let's look at this faithful patriarch. And we're going to learn right here is this. A faithful patriarch sees beyond this life. He looks beyond his earthly years. Our text begins in verse 1 with telling us of the advancement of Abraham's age. Listen to what it says. Now, Abraham was old. Okay. Normally, you don't just say that like to another person. You're old. Well, the, yeah, the writer can do that. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. In fact, here Abraham is old in age, but he had seen through his years the Hesed, the loyal love of his God. God had been loyal to his promise. If you remember back in Genesis chapter 12, God had given promises to Abraham and says, Abraham, if you will leave your country and you will leave your people, I will bless you greatly. I'm going to give you a land, I'm going to give you a son, and I'm going to be giving you a blessing. And of course, Abraham sees that steadfast love and responds to it and follows the Lord. And what you see spelled out in the first verse of this chapter is this. God does just what he says he would do. Did you catch that? Read, read verse 1 again. It says this. Now Abraham was, wo- uh, was old, well advanced in age. And then it says this. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in what? All things. God said he'd bless him, and did he do it? He did. He obeyed. I mean, he, he performed the promises that he said he would do. And as a reminder to you, God will show, if you are his son or daughter, he will show you his hesed, his loyal love. Now, sometimes you may not see through the weeds, and sometimes you may feel like you are having a really hard time, but you will need to do what we encouraged you a number of weeks ago in the book of Habakkuk to do, wait for it. It will come through the clouds, and you will see it. It's always there, just like the sun. Sometimes clouds block it, but his hesed love is always evident and always there and always is shining. You may put up your own clouds sometimes, but those of you who are his children, his hesed love is there. And so what do we find in this chapter 24 is you find Abraham, who has experienced this steadfast love, We see him now respond to this great love of his God and honor the Lord with his future decisions in life. What does he do? Well, in our text, what Josh read a few minutes ago, he calls his servant, who I believe was possibly a guy who was referred to earlier, a guy by the name of Eliezer. If you remember, Abraham was wondering if Eliezer, his servant, should be his heir since he had no children at that particular point. And he was, he, uh, evidently, this particular servant in this particular chapter is the oldest, and he had committed all things unto him. So my suggestion is, maybe if you put a name on it, it was Eliezer. So he calls his servant, and he calls him to make an oath by laying his hand on his thigh a very personal and solemn commitment. I'm glad we no longer make commitments that way, okay? I'm glad I don't have to do a closing and lay my hand on anyone's thigh or anything like that. This was a solemn commitment. Notice Abraham, as he's making this solemn commitment, he makes this servant swear by Yahweh or the Lord. What this shouts to me And what this is evidence to me about is that this servant was also a follower of the Lord, of Yahweh. He wouldn't have had him swear but by his own God himself in order to keep his word. But he has him swear and he starts to get his servant ready to perform 
Something that would honor his God in what Abraham was about to do. But don't just notice that. Notice as well, at this point, Abraham's knowledge of God. Go to verse 3. It says this. It says, that I may make you swear by the Lord. And what does he call the Lord? The God of heaven and the God of earth. So by this time, Abraham understood that God is one who's in charge of all things. He had grown in this understanding. He had meditated much on this. And now he asked the servant, by the God of heaven and earth, to go find a wife for his son Isaac from his own relatives back in Mesopotamia. Now notice that he did not want Isaac to go. In fact, he says it twice. He says it in verse 6. Let me read it to you. It says, And Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. He does it again in verse 8. You say, Pastor Brian, why did he not want Isaac to go back to Mesopotamia? Well, I possibly think that the reason was this. He doesn't want in any way to jeopardize his commitment to God's plan. He had left there many years before, and he was committed. He had buried his wife there in Cana. Their future was in Cana, and he in no way wanted to, you could say, cause some problems. He also knew that the area that he had lived in for decades was a very pagan area. Of course, Mesopotamia was pagan too. But he knew the Canaanites. He had seen the results of even his nephew and his daughters who were marrying or preparing to marry some people there in Sodom and just the wickedness of that city. And and probably for him, he says, we've got to be careful. And his, his desire was to lead his son to follow in the footsteps of his faith. And of course, as a side note here, our job as followers of Christ is to pass on to the next generation our faith and make decisions in reference to the decisions that we can make in order to, you could say, provide guardrails to help our kids not use, I mean, to use our lives in many ways as stepping stones to follow Christ rather than diving boards to jump back into the world. Notice as well that Abraham reflects on what God had done for him individually. Go to verse 7. It says this, the Lord, the God of heaven, what did he do? He took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred. He spoke to me and he swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. What did he know? He knew God had done some great things in his life and he was confident of it. God, you had done this, you had done this, but not only that, notice his confidence in the future of God's work in his life. Look what it says at the end of verse 7. He says this, He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Now, no doubt Abraham had grown in his confidence in God. Here is, there's a lot of confidence. Go, God's going to bless you. He'll send his angel. You'll You'll get a wife for Isaac there. However, Abraham also knew of man's responses and how sometimes they cannot align with God initially. And as a reminder to all of you, uh, God's will will be done. You might as well submit to it because it's going to happen. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of things in heaven, of things in earth. You may not have bowed to Jesus right now, but let me tell you, you will. You will one day. And you might as well do it now and get your life aligned. But Abraham knew that sometimes man wasn't aligned and he knew the potential of man's rebellion against God's plan. So he gives his servant a little bit of an out. He says, well, if the wife refuses or if this woman refuses, he says this in verse 8. He says this, but if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from the oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning the matter. Now let me just stop here for just a moment. And I want you to realize that what we just heard were Abraham's last interactions verbally on this planet that we have recorded. He doesn't talk anymore, okay? 
This is kind of the end of Abraham's life. And because we're ending his, his journey today, I want you just for a moment, before we continue on in this story, turn one page over for some of you to chapter 25. We learn of a few other aspects of Abraham's life. We learn of a third woman in his life. In verse 1 of chapter 25, her name is Keturah. It says, and Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. Now, he, she could have been his third wife during Sarah's life, just so you know it. It sounds like he did it afterwards, some of the texts, but it doesn't require that. He could have had a third wife during, of course, we know Hagar and then Keturah. Uh, she's called both a wife here and she's called a concubine in another place. You say, what was a concubine? It was kind of a, a second class wife at that particular day and age. If indeed Abraham took Keturah during Sarah's, before Sarah's death, it would be another evidence of Abraham's failure at a one flesh union with his wife. I am glad that the Bible does record man's failures and his successes. And just so as you read through the patriarchs, don't be looking at these guys and thinking, these are the ones that did everything right. These are the guys who many of them did everything wrong, but in spite of this, God was still after what he was going to do in this world. And he was committed to bless. Abraham, we find, had more children but notice his commitment to one whom God had promised, and it was to Isaac. Go to verse 5 of chapter 25. It says, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of the concubines, Abraham gave gifts. You say, why did, why did Abraham do all this? Well, God's ultimate plan was going to bless all the world through Isaac. So even though you say, oh, those guys only got gifts, well, let me tell you, God blessing Isaac ultimately would lead to all the world being blessed. God had a plan, and he was working out his plan. And Abraham knew the plan, and so he made his choices even with his, you could say, executing his will with an eye on eternity. Abraham would live to 175, and look what it says in verse 8. This is kind of the end of his life. It says, Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years. And then it says this, and he was gathered unto his people. You know what that does? That speaks of life after death. Some people have tried to say, hey, isn't that like he gathered with his people? That means his bones were with his people. No, that he talks about his burial next. This is something totally different. This is actually what happens when God's people die. They are gathered with more of God's people in God's presence in heaven. Why? Because he lived by faith. He had faith in his God. So all of this to show you this. All the final works on earth of Abraham. Okay, so we've been looking at Abraham's life. Last week we looked at how he buries his wife by faith in the land of Canaan because he knows God's going give, to give them that land. Now he marries off his son and his mindset is this, God, you're going to try to produce, you are going to produce a seed ultimately through this and you're going to bless the world through it. So I'm focusing on this. And then he executes his will but it's almost like this. One eye is on earth. The other eye is on eternity in heaven. He is making his decisions based on that. The Bible says in another place, he is looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. He's living by faith. This isn't the end, and he knew it. So I stop here to tell you this. As we look at Abraham in the first you could say nine verses of chapter 24 in the beginning of chapter 25. One of the evidences of people who live by faith is that they desire to preserve and to promote God's plan to the next generation. And they make their plans in such a way that everything is pointing toward the future and what God's doing. People of faith have a consciousness 
of what God has done for them. Abraham did. He said, God, you've done this for me. You've done this for me. But they also have a confidence in the future work of God. God, you're going to bring us to this land. You're going to save this people. You're going to bless this world. I know what you're going to do, and I have a confidence in that. For those of you who are, let's say, over the hill, I could say you're old and advanced in years, okay? Many of us are there, okay? Or many of us are like, we're on the other side, we're, and it's quickly going downhill. Let me remind you and entreat you to live your life every day by faith and make your decisions understanding God's loyal love to you Remind yourself of what he's done for you and make all your choices, whether it's choosing a plot, whether it's executing your will, whether it's helping your children find the people they're going to marry, do your best to point people to the future, to the promises of God. What has he done for you? And display that faith in the future work of God. That means you ought to make all your decisions based on God's future after you. You ought to set up your children. Are you continuing to grow in your knowledge of God? Are you continuing to grow in your faith? You say, how do I grow in my faith, Pastor Brian? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I tell you, I am always challenged. I need to do more with passing on to my children the word of God. Parents, don't just rely on Juana and Sunday school. Teach them, what does the Bible say? It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. God, that's what you want us to do. Those of you, we've got to do this. But also make all your choices with one eye on an attorney, whether you're buying something, whether you're taking a job, whatever you do this week, let it be known that one eye is on heaven. Here was a man who had experienced God hesed, his steadfast love, and he reciprocated it. And those of you who have experienced God hesed love, and I'm looking at some of you, you have been more blessed than most people on this planet. And if he has given his hesed love for you, you ought to give all of your loyal love to him. You ought to make those decisions. In fact, this week when you're tempted to sin, what can help you overcome your love for that sin? Bask in the incredible, steadfast love of your God for you. Only a greater love will defeat those lesser loves. Here was a man, a patriarch, who in many ways saw beyond his life. So a faithful patriarch sees beyond this life. Second thing I want you to see is this, a faithful servant sees the faithful love of God. And what we're going to find is this faithful servant, he gets to bask in God's hesed. So what happens? Well, Abraham's servant now, who has been given an oath to go find a wife for Isaac, now travels to Mesopotamia. This probably took around, at that day, point, day in time, about 30 days one way. He comes to the city of Nahor. Notice the details of the story. Now, I'm not going to read all the story again. Hopefully, you were paying attention during the scripture reading. Make sure you do that each time we read our scripture. But let me just point out in the story that he arrives at the well. And it's interesting, did you know that wells are kind of like the Old Testament dating sites? Okay, we've got eHarmony in our day, okay? The wells, you, you find like budding relationships or things get connected here, okay? You're going to see it later on with some of the patriarchs. But Moses, who by under the inspiration of God preserves this story for us, it's great that he gives details. You, you see that the camels kneel, he has them kneel. Some of you have seen camels do that before. He kneels them, and it's evening time. He's at the well. What does the servant do? Well, he does what we should all do when seeking to do God's will. He prays. Listen to what he says. Go to verse 12 of our text. 
He says, and he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Show your hesed to my master. He says, behold, I'm standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I say, please let down your jar that I may drink And who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown hesed to your master. Did you notice how immediate he wants the request? Today, God. I mean, how many of you ever done that? When your prayer, God, I don't want you to answer this in a week. I want you to do it today. In fact, I want you to do it right now. That's what he's doing. He's asking God to do such a thing. Now, personally, I don't recommend that you be a person that is always putting God in your box and saying, God, this is what you're going to have to do for me. I want you to show me this. But as that coming out of one side of my mouth, at the same time, I don't want you to abandon the type of faith that is in this verse. Here is a man who says, God, I'm asking you to do this. And I've heard evidence of people who in many ways prayed this way. I remember one of my mentors telling me the story of his father and how his father had pushed against the call to the ministry. And his mom, which was my mentor's grandmother, really believed that her son was called to the ministry and that he needed to just submit to what God was doing. And so she started praying. And my mentor told me that his grandmother told his dad, over the next number of weeks, we're going to visit a few different churches. And I'm going to pray, because I think you're running from God's call, I'm going to pray that over the next number of weeks, all the preachers preach from the book of Jonah. So she told him that. And this woman was a prayer warrior. Guess what? First week, the preacher preaches on what? Jonah. And I can't remember the consecutive amount of weeks, but I remember him telling me how it was like one of the last Sundays that she had prayed that God would do it. They showed up at a church, and the preacher particularly said, I don't know why I was planning to preach from another text, but for some reason I feel very inclined to preach from the book of Jonah today. Guess what? That guy became a preacher and was a preacher his whole adult life. I say that all because don't necessarily put God in a box, but let me tell you, can God answer prayer? Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And there are some women even associated with this church that I know of who, if If they started to pray that I would die, I'd be needing to go over and buy a casket. Because it, pray and ask. Well, he prays. And he asks God, and and, and let me just say, add to that. You better be someone who is walking with the Lord if you're going to be that particular about your prayers. Get to know him. But notice the servant asked God to show his hesed twice. He tells him twice, show your steadfast love. Show your steadfast love. And while he is finishing his what? Prayer. He's not even done praying. He hadn't even said, of course at that time he probably wouldn't have said in Jesus' name, amen. And learned Jesus' name. He hadn't even said the amen. And what happens? Rebecca shows up. Isn't God's work amazing? In fact, in the book of Isaiah, verse, chapter 65, it says this, Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. And what we do is we see here this servant see God answer his prayer. We find out about this woman, Rebecca. We find out about her ancestry. Uh, the servant finds out who, what her ancestry is after the event. Moses gives it to us in the account at the beginning of it, the front end. She fits all the categories. Of course, 
Isaac, maybe before the servant left, he probably added that on to it. He says, make sure she looks good. Make sure she's attractive. I know Abraham says all this, but I want you to do this. It says she was attractive. She was a virgin. She was of Abraham's family. But then notice how quickly the event occurs. Some of you, after the message today, let me encourage you to read it over again. It's almost like the whole story is going downhill at a speed. It says that the servant ran to the well. It says that she quickly let down her jar. It says that she quickly emptied the jar. It says that she ran to the well. What does that all shout to me? It's this. God is very quick to answer. He is ready to go if you will call and ask him. And it's almost like this situation is like, hey, you asked me to show my, hes- my hesed, my steadfast love? Take a look and watch him answer. And he does it incredibly quick. I love where it says that the servant, when he saw her go and start watering the camels, and I'm not going to give you the, I mean, I remember in Sunday school, people would measure out how many gallons would a camel drink, and that's 10 camels. And this was not just, I'm going to go get him a few water bottles, okay? This was a lot of work that she did. Well, the Bible says that he, w- he was in silence during all of this. And, and my interpretation of that is he was dumbfounded. I cannot believe what's happening right now. And after she's done, the servant learns that she is Abraham's relative, just like he asked. And she invites him to her home And notice his response. Go to verse 26 of our text. It says this, The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord. You know, that's our first response when you and I see the hesed, steadfast love of God. You know what we should do? We should worship. God, I cannot believe you did it. You did it again. You showed your steadfast love. So he thinks of his God first, But then he thanks God in reference to Abraham, his master. He thinks of Abraham, he says, and and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham. And then finally he thinks of himself, and he says this, who has not forsaken his hesed, his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. And then then he says, as for me, the Lord led me in the way to the house of my master's kin. God, you let me You let me see this. You led me in the way. You know what the rest of the story does? The rest of the story shows the servant's interaction with his family. What happens really is the whole story is repeated again by the servant. So God tells the story through Moses, and then the the servant, he gets to the house, and he recounts the whole story to the family, how he had prayed up into his prayer of thanksgiving. The family, after they hear the whole story and him give his testimony, you could say, the family cannot say anything against it. Listen to what they say in verse 50 and 51. It says, And Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing has come from Yahweh, from the Lord. We cannot speak you bad or good. I mean, we're just not even talking. It's almost like we better just stop talking right now because this is so clearly God who's working. And of course, you read the rest of the story. The servant is ready to go the next day. He's ready to get this thing done. He's ready to get Rebecca back, Isaac's 37. Okay, he's ready to get married, okay? He's ready to get back. The family asks for some more time. Give us a few days. And of course, Rebecca agrees to go right away. She's ready to go. And the text ends with the servant bringing Rebecca and her meeting Isaac. and, And basically, God furthers his plan. But stop for a moment and do this with me. What do we learn from this servant? What do we learn from him? I believe, number one, you see this. You see his clear understanding 
of the loyal love of God. He understood hesed. He had seen it played out in the life of his master, Abraham. And you know what you and I need to do? We need to be people that seek to understand better the incredible love and commitment of our God. Oh, that you and I, what does Romans say? That we would understand the love of what? Christ that passeth under what? Standing. You know, in the book of Ephesians, right in the middle of that, as Paul writes out all the great things that God had done for the Ephesians, and at the end of chapter 3, what does he pray for? I pray that you would understand the love of God, its breath, its width, that you would be able to comprehend this. Because the more you and I understand God's hesed, his loving loyalty to us, the more it'll cause us to God, I want to pray to you and ask on behalf of your loyal love, He who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for you, how shall he not freely give you all things? And here was a man who understood the love of God, and he prays accordingly. And you know what prayer is? Prayer is our declaration of dependence upon God. And what happens? God brings about the success. And you know what the servant's able to do? He's able to be a partaker of God's work. I'll tell you, there is nothing quite like when you realize that you just saw the hand of God and that God actually used you. That is one of the most special things. Those of you who have uh, maybe in your faith have not developed to that point where you really have seen the work of God, let me encourage you to go hard after him. And there will be times that he will break through and show you things that you're like, God, you did this. One of my greatest joys in life has been able to see God's work that's done in and through me. Lebanon Baptist Church, your God is great and steadfast love, and he is quick to display it to those who serve him and call on him. As I said, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou know know not. You know what? I can recount on my own life's journey, I, I, I kind of wish I would have kept a journal all my years of ministry. There's been times like I've done kind of like Brian's diary, but it's like if you were to read it, it was like, it's like 5% of my life. But there have been times that it's been like I felt like the guy at the well. God, I can't believe you did that. And you did that for me. I think I've told you the story. I remember one time my car broke down in the middle of nowhere on my way up to a Christian camp in North Carolina. It was nighttime, and it died. I had a 1982 Honda Prelude, and nothing was happening. And I can still remember I had to get up to a certain event. I just laid my head against the steering wheel. And as clear as day, I said, God, I can't fix my car. This is before cell phones, Okay. It wasn't like, just pick up a phone, call AAA. I was in the middle of nowhere, and I was just say, God, you're going to have to fix my car. I can't do this. And before I was done praying, when I finally lifted up, a guy had stopped behind me in the middle of nowhere and had, was wearing a Ford Motor Company shirt. And on it, his name, Bob. I still possibly think that that may have been one of the only times in my life that I entertained an angel unaware. And you know what? God fixed my car. And I remember just driving up the rest of the way. I was like, God, you did that for me. You answered my prayer. I can remember years ago when I was a youth pastor, we'd been on a mission trip to Mexico for an entire week, sleeping on, I think the guys slept on the roof, the girls slept in an uh, un-air-conditioned area. We were dirty, filthy. It had been a crazy week, and we're ready to get back to Charlotte, to where I was a youth pastor. And so we're flying through Houston on our way home, and that day there was a huge thunderstorm in Houston. And for a couple of hours, I believe it was, we circled Houston, and they couldn't let us land. And so they finally diverted us to Corpus Christi. We sat on the tarmac there, and then finally they got us to Houston at the end of the day, but they had... uh, All the flights had left for Charlotte. They couldn't get all our group on it. They couldn't get our luggage. 
and we were stuck there. And I can distinctly remember being on a shuttle to our hotel for that night and all of us gathering together and saying, God, we don't know why you did this, but you are sovereign, you're in charge of all things, and we're trusting you. And I remember we sang a song even together on that vehicle, God makes no mistakes. The following day, as we are scattered across the airplane, because we're no longer in a block of seats, because all of our seats were the day before, they scattered us across the plane. And it was on that last leg from Houston to Atlanta, we got back to Charlotte, or excuse me, Houston to Charlotte. I'm in Atlanta now. Um, We got off the plane. I got to, and another kid in our youth group, got to lead two people to the Lord on the plane during that last flight that we would have never have sat by. And we sat there and he said, God, you did this. And it was almost like the, the, the clouds opened up. You know what? That doesn't just happen in events like this. Sometimes those times when I see God has said love is at 5.30 in the morning or 6.30 in the morning when I'm going through a hard time and I'm just reading through scripture and all of a sudden, God, you let me read that today. Thank you for your hesed, your steadfast love. And my response to that, God, you did this. God's faithful servants get to see his faithful love. That illustrates my final point and it's this, a faithful God providentially works out his plan. Did you know that all through our text, We not only see God's hesed, what's hesed? It's his faithful, steadfast love, but we also see his divine providence. God doesn't simply have love. He has power. He has all power. A lot of you have a mom and dad who love you, but they don't have all power. They can't work all things after the counsel of their own will. They don't have the money tree that you wish you had. But let me tell you about God. Your God is not only full of hesed, steadfast love, but he is also full of divine providence and he works everything out to his own plan. You say, what's divine providence? Wayne Grudem, the theologian, said this. It is this. God is continually involved in all created things in such a way that he keeps them all existing and maintaining the properties with which he created them. So that's just telling you everything that's holding together, every breath you take, everything that's happening, all the molecules and atoms of this, the reason they all function the way they do is because God oversees it. Then it says this, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to act as they do and directs them to fulfill his purposes. And why did that Rebecca show up at that well when he showed up at that well at that same time? That was not coincidence. We have a lot of people who talk about fate and coincidences. Let me tell you, with God, there is no coincidence. With God, there is always providence. He is in charge of all things. There is a God who stands above all things, working them out to his plan. You may only see one side of the picture, but let me tell you, one day when you're able to see the mosaic of all of God's work on this planet, one day you're going to look at it and say, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all those who trust in him. He is working out his plan of redemption. In fact, in our text, all through it, God is preserving a family to be the cradle from which his son would one day come. All of this was concerning a wife for Isaac. Why? Because Isaac would need to have a son. And who that son was, was Jacob. Israel was his other name. And Israel would have Judah. And then fast forward many years, that son would have Boaz. And then fast forward a little bit, then David. And then fast forward many years, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those that are under the law. And what did that son do? Who his own self bore our sins on his own body on the tree. That ultimately by blessing through one family, 
Jews, Gentiles, and the world, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what all of this is? This is divine providence, and this is divine hesed. God's loyal love and God's great power, all working together to fulfill God's plan. So today we've learned this. God shows his faithful love to his faithful servants. You know what all of you have? You have some take-home projects. You know what they are? Number one, the proper response to God's loyal love in your life is reciprocated loyal love. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Lebanon Baptist Church, what do you love more than anything? You know what it should be? It should be your God. And all of your responses this week and all of your decisions ought to reflect that you love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That's the proper response. And for you to get your eyes, not just on this life, but on eternity. And then I challenge you to do this. Pray, and as Tori sang a few minutes ago, rest in the steadfast love and perfect providence of God. Pray to this end. He's working out all things to meet his desired end. So this morning, what's happening? This morning, we are leaving Abraham. We've spent 12 weeks here. We've looked at his life. But what I ask you to do is I'm asking you to look beyond Abraham. One of my favorite sites in this country is a place my family visited last summer. This is a picture of the Grand Tetons and a little house in front of it. This is called Mormon Row. I guess settlers there uh, built on this particular row and this is a very famous famously photographed area. In the foreground, what you find is a man-made object that over the test of time, this has lasted a, a, dec- a, uh, a century, century and a half. No doubt it's going to be gone one day. You know what? Abraham is in many ways like this house. We've looked at him. We've looked at his life. But you know what? The site is not simply the house. I want you to see beyond his life. I want you to see beyond Abraham. And I want you to look to the hills from whence comes your help. I want you to see the God who stands behind the backdrop, who is filled with hesed love, and who is filled with divine providence. And I want you to pursue him and know him and trust him till you, in many ways, arrive at that city whose builder and maker is God. May God help us to do this. Let's pray.